Okay, so the big hand on the NTP client is on the 12. It's uh, about time I got going. Hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dave. I've spent uh, the last nearly eight years at AWS helping customers address their security requirements as well as writing and inventing stuff. Uh, this is a, marked as a 400 level session. So uh, it does admittedly start out a little bit introductory, but it does get pretty deep pretty quickly. And hopefully there's stuff in here to uh, give uh, pause for thought and ideas to my fellow security geeks and also um, Data, data scientists, and maybe even also lawyers and mathematicians. So we have quite a lot on the agenda, and I will need to take it at a bit of a gallop, but obviously this is all getting recorded. Thank you. So as we advance from section to section, I'll bring the agenda up, uh, slide up with a we are here highlight on it. So let's crack on and start at the beginning. Now. One of my rules of thumb is that the harder something is for the human brain to do, the more standards and frameworks there are for doing it. And threat modeling really does fit this rule. So once you've characterized the scenarios in which your software can go wrong, and what its attack surface looks like, and what these look like from the perspective of your risk appetite, you can then go and create a control framework to mitigate the material risks to the point where they're considered residual risks, and then determine what deployment security tools and architectural elements you need to include in order to affect that usefully. And my colleague Darren Boyd actually wrote a useful post on our security blog last year, primarily on organizational considerations for building threat models, but also touching on frameworks. We like Stride, we use it a lot, but it's not the only framework we use. And I, I also like to refer to an old research paper by Dan Ionita at the University of Twent, who's gone on to do further research in this area. And the paper looks at pros and cons of various different threat modeling standards. Uh, quite a few of the newer ones um, from the last couple of three years aren't actually included in it, but it's still very useful. And the Wikipedia page for threat modeling, which, uh, is, which is just down there at the bottom, is pretty good too, and has plenty of external references to go and look at. So why am I talking about threat modeling? How does machine learning fit into threat modeling as we understand it? Let's have a look at how it fits in with uh, your typical confidentiality, integrity, and availability view of security. Continuous learning systems in particular are very, very fun, as the data that they train on is also the data that they're fed at runtime. And you can literally get garbage in, garbage out in the form of a Sybil attack when a threat actor feeds your model that's live in production inappropriate data, which it'll incorporate into its training and regurgitate. I'm not quite sure where accuracy and appropriateness fit in a CIA context, though. In the Parkerian hexad, which I also like, um, they'd come under utility. So we also need to not only address exfiltration of models, but also exfiltration of training data from models, which is also known in, in the discipline as model inversion. Um, there's now um, threat, well, academia and standards bodies are now also producing threat analysis approaches specifically for use in machine learning context to extend what you may have seen before. And the Etsy guide in particular is uh, very much the preferred quick reference document on machine learning threats and analysis. And uh, for some friends of mine working in machine learning security full time in interesting places. So let's have a brief look at what people really mean when they talk about machine learning. There's a number of approaches to problem solving with machine learning from classifying data through other categories of decision making. And if you look at the overall machine learning development and deployment cycle, we'll be using this uh, diagram quite a bit. Most of the time and effort is taken in data preparation and cleaning and feature engineering. So it's figuring out how to process the data that you've got in as, in as raw content to drop properties which aren't important to affecting the model's decisions and transforming the properties which are to bring out the differences that you might want to distinguish on. So the latter is typically done with a bunch of linear algebra. And this is also where you get your best opportunity to transform your data 
in such a way that it can't be converted back to the data that was originally captured. We'll get on to questions of anonymization and how to do it in a bit. So once data preparation has uh, handled any omissions or obvious errors in the raw data you've taken in, feature engineering is, as I said, a whole bunch of typically linear algebra. Though if you want to get into manifold theory, which uh, comes up in a few particular uh, model areas, uh, you can wind up getting into higher order mathematics there as well. Uh, classifiers and regression models typically get represented as a line, not necessarily a straight one, on a 2D Cartesian graph. And um, classifiers identify stuff based on which side of the line they're on. Regression models do things like least distance from line mappings. And yeah, continuous learning models really are the least predictable of the models that you get out there as they're continually retraining themselves based on the input they're fed. So this obviously means that the model isn't static, which means you can't make it operationally immutable. And the data sent to the model in use is a means of attacking its operation. So for these kinds of models, you definitely want to be doing continuous monitoring of your model, as well as regular snapshotting and pre and post filtering of the model, more on which in a bit. Now, I've heard some people take a view in the last few years that the answer's ML, now what's the question? And in practice, reality is rather more nuanced. And there's a whole bunch of problems, granted, that customers want to solve where machine learning really is the only approach that's likely to work. I really like the quote in the middle of this slide here, that ML is for cases where the desired behavior can't be effectively expressed in software logic without dependency on external data. And I actually consider that to be the qualifying criterion in a nutshell. Uh, the paper it, com it comes from on uh, technical debt in machine learning systems is actually an interesting read as a whole. Uh, one thing we'll touch on at a few points in the session is that machine learning models don't always return accurate results. And this is something which needs to be factored into any overall solution design to make the solution robust against, against this eventuality as best you can. So the one thing I'm going to say here regarding when, not, when to use machine learning and when not is that I'm not a lawyer, weighs white flag, and nothing I'm going to say in this presentation should be considered legal advice. The only thing I'm going to say about legal advice, though, is that there are times when you come to consider some of the things I'll be mentioning where you may very well want to consult your lawyers. And what I'm covering today will naturally be a non-complete set of these circumstances. So there's a number of contexts in which ML really isn't the natural or best choice for a potential solution. And it can, for example, it could be a lot simpler to parse text in a consistent format, such as would come in a bunch of log files, and spot anomalies in it by writing maybe 30 lines of Python than feeding it into something like look out for metrics. Uh, you'll also need a lot less data for starters in order to start getting useful results. And as I said, ML models in normal circumstances can be reasonably accurate, but you're not going to get accuracy 100% of the time, except in really exceptional circumstances. Now, our ML services as AWS naturally come with their own security mechanisms included. So first, it all starts with IAM, so uh, one of our favorite services, and indeed service control policies in organizations. So as you would with any other service, go have a read of the actions list to identify useful IAM actions for the services you're using. Don't forget to apply fine-grained conditions where appropriate. And once you've identified the capabilities to scope your roles and permissions to, ensure you're using those controls to enforce least privilege access for people. Uh, many of the services may operate as a specific role. For example, the notebooks in SageMaker use an execution role of their own. And be sure to search these out in the documents and uh, pay attention to them as well. So there'll be some diagrams coming up shortly which illustrate the points on this slide here. Um, encryption in transit overhead very much depends on the model engine that you're using. Unsurprisingly, there's less overhead for a small number of long-lived connections and uh, rather more for, well, a bit more 
for lots of short-lived connections, since of course the primary overhead is in the RSA setup rather than the AES that you then switch Cypher to. Um, obviously, we recommend encrypting notebooks and the data in them at rest, um, particularly where your data classification requires. Um, SageMaker Studio has its own further mechanisms, including the ability to create signed URLs for console access. And there's a link to a blog post coming up, um, coming up toward the end, which covers setting these up later. So by default, SageMaker notebooks route all traffic over public routable networks and use standard public AWS API endpoints for getting data and writing logs. So this is SageMaker as it comes out of the box using a note, uh, actually working on a notebook. However, if you're working with valuable algor algorithms, you can extend an ENI very much in the same way that Private Link does into the, your subnet from the SageMaker notebook VPC such that you're not communicating over an external network. And naturally, this means you don't need an internet gateway on your own VPC to use the notebook in your own services. And all user access winds up being, as you can see here, um, authenticated and authorized by the, um, or by the auth proxy service that you've got built into SageMaker there. You can use a VPC to restrict notebook access to be from, for example, your corporate environment, if you've got something like a direct link into a VPC of your own. And you can use the same private link-like technique to extend data and algorithm ENIs into your VPC for your training process. So the only service ultimately which needs to talk to a public API endpoint when you're doing model training is CloudWatch Logs. And if you're not using a custom algorithm, you don't have to extend the algorithm ENIs at all, but can keep them isolated in SageMaker's own VPC. Once you've got your model trained and running, you can, again, just have data ENIs extended into your data holding account, private link style, and use a VPC private endpoint to get at your data in S3 without sending traffic across a world routable network and again, just sending CloudWatch logs out via that way. This can also be used in cases where an algorithm or model owner wants to offer a model for use by an owner of data, such that the data owner and model owner never get access to each other's intellectual property. And the SageMaker service account, which is actually owned by us at AWS, acts as an intermediary in this context, effectively putting the algorithm in escrow and models purchased via the uh, model marketplace operate this way. Uh, there's a couple of self-paced online labs on setting these configurations up, and I'll get to these uh, with, well, get to the links to these later on. So when you go looking at the full set of ML services we offer, your mileage does vary regarding what access AWS service teams can have. This is laid out in clause 50.3 in our service terms. Uh, which I'm sure, of course, you always read before considering adopting a new service, really. And a lot of the higher level services, um, as you can see from, the, uh, from that clause, have an opt-out available um, at organization level as per that clause 50.3. There's a detailed page in the organization's user guide there on how to go about setting it up. And this is yet another good reason to use organizations and multi-account structures. Um, in my personal view, service control policies rule, and they're actually my favorite feature in all of AWS, but then again, I'm an old school mandatory access control geek. You'll find yourself using a lot of data if you go down a machine learning route for um, developing a solution to a problem, and you'll need to take care and have mechanisms to manage that data. So data science and model training is one of those rare circumstances where there's actually a legitimate need to have access to copy of production data without actually being in a production environment. The usual rule of thumb is that prod data should only live in prod environments with the exception of backups. And this obviously means that we need to make our accounts which can access such data, um, such as the, the accounts that our data scientists are using, um, depending on how much desensitizing processing we're able to do in the prod environment before exporting the data, to establish a trust gradient. So essentially, we want to go down a protectors prod discipline route, 
while still facilitating human access. And this can make for a really delicate balance to find um, in terms of what your data scientists are able to see. So we published a blog post about this with a reference architecture. And you can, you can actually build a data science environment in a multi-account context to minimize the amount of sensitive data which needs to be seen in your data science environment. Um, if you go building an ETL pipeline in your prod environment up there at the top right uh, to extract and transform or redact your prod data inside the, pro the prod boundary, that actually um, does good things for you. Uh, we're using Lambda in this example, as we did in our blog post. But obviously, um, now that uh, there's uh, more services available for doing this kind of thing, you can, um, you can manipulate your data using AppFlow or Glue Data Brew or SageMaker Data Wrangler. Also, you can have your data scientists in their account um, down at the uh, bottom, in the bottom left there, um, use workspaces to access the environment over PC over IP where you set the PC over IP server up on the workspaces so that they can't bulk copy or copy and paste code or data out of the environment. And as they'll still want internet access to do things like fetch new packages, even though you can have local mirrors in the main account using code artifact these days, you can have outbound filtering proxies as part, as part of your means of preventing valuable assets which shouldn't become public from doing so. If you're using SageMaker Studio, there's a couple of blog posts later which are also very recommended reading. Um, first is about integrating network firewall, which we kept as a squid farm in our architecture here, um, in part because network firewall hadn't launched when we wrote it, but also because network firewall doesn't actually do TLS decrypt yet. Whereas, of course, with something like Squid, Peak, and Splice, you can do that. So we could use a service control policy to make our test and training data immutable. But if any of your data can be interpreted by a lawyer as being personally identifiable and viable information, this might change that. So I'm going to definitely need to read this bit. GDPR Chapter Three, Section Three, Article Seventeen, Clause One in the version on the in the version that's on the EU website. Uh, versions incorporated into local legislation may differ, though. Says the data subject shall have the right to obtain from the controller the erasure of personal data concerning him or her without undue delay, and the controller shall have the obligation to erase personal data without undue delay when one of the following grounds applies and the appropriate one in this context is B, the data subject withdraws consent on which the processing is based. So this makes life interesting when it comes to models which have been trained using data that a lawyer might interpret as being PII. So let's have a look back at our cycle. So and where can we most readily remove personal data so that our model doesn't contain it in the first place? Obviously, this is where our data preparation and cleaning and feature engineering can both fit, certainly for a lot of circumstances involving textual data. Now, you can index your ML training and test data to see what Macy thinks is PII, for example, using either the managed identifiers that we provide or your own custom data identifiers, and store that index somewhere like DynamoDB. And, but if your data isn't textual, this is somewhat harder, and you'll see why in a moment. So you could build yourself an ingest pipeline to filter and index data as it makes its way to the bucket that your training and test data resides in, and which you point your model at for training. So it might look something like this if you have lots of different kinds of models using different data. So as you can see, we've got examples here, a bit of a smorgasbord of transcribe and recognition and Macy to look at uh, handwritten text or images or, um, and, and, then, and then Macy from the point of view of dis distinguishing what, it, what is considered and what isn't PII. Um, being able to build and manage training pipelines for models is now a feature of SageMaker with its own SageMaker pipelines. And this makes this kind of cycle rather easier to set up. There's a more tested in real world pipeline from, uh, from uh, friends of mine in our financial services team in the data redaction um, blog post here, which is well worth a look. 
And if you need to quickly um, search and find and redact data from a bucket in practice, um, which has got a whole bunch of data in it, see the quick search and uh, deletion solution that's in GitHub at the top there. But we need to know what is, and just importantly, what is not pers personally identifiable information. And I'm going to need to read this bit again. GDPR chapter one, article four, clause one. Personal data means any, any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, brackets data subject. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, really important term there, in particular by reference to an identifier such as a name, an identification number, location data, an online identifier, or to one or more factors specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of that natural person. Phew. I said this made life interesting. And determining whether or not data is PII actually requires having access to a lot more data than which might also be PII. I'll give you a personal example, in fact. Now, the clause actually says, my name is PII. But is it really? I mean, there's about another four and a half thousand David Walkers on the UK electoral roll. But you need access to the UK electoral roll in order to know that. Similarly, um, is my address PII? In my case, it happens to be because I'm the only person at my address. But you need access to either UK census data, which doesn't get released for another, for another 90 something years, or, in my case, the council tax data for Basingstoke and Dean District Council to know that. So what is and what isn't PII actually really isn't that well defined. So talk to your lawyers. Get them to make a list by data type of what they do and don't consider to be PII for all data types that might go anywhere in any network packet into, around, and out of your system. Obviously, this list may be useful in legal matters over time, so be sure to jointly maintain it with your nice legal team as your plans and your services change. Now, I mentioned jigsaw attacks here. Uh, these are pretty insidious things. If you think you remove PII from a data set involving fine-grained information, Somebody else might actually also have a data set that it could be combined with to de-anonymize de the data based on common circumstantial information. And you'd neither know about this nor indeed be able to do much about it if your data set gets obtained. So a common approach to anonymizing numeric data at least is to include an aggregation step where multiple elements such as columns in a table are combined arithmetically or an averaging step such as is, is made over spreadsheet rows or table rows. Uh, averaging means that when you graph the data, obviously a lot of the spiky detail in it gets smoothed out. But the trouble there is this also makes the resulting data less useful for actually training a model with. And there is another approach to this, though, coming up in a moment. Also, if you, th if you were thinking that you might be able to delete, a, uh, to delete data from a trained model, I'm afraid I've got to disappoint you. If you try deleting data from a model, it breaks. And obviously, if your model is continuous learning, you want to be logging all the data that's fed into it, and as previously mentioned, frequently taking time index snapshots of it, which can be useful for rollback in the event that your model starts misbehaving based on what's being fed to it. If your model really does need to use personal data to function well, and ideally you want to avoid this, you probably also want to take a look at this approach here. Uh, granted, it reduces the accuracy of the model, but if done carefully, the reduction can be minimized. The result of the paper here got the accuracy reduction down to 3%, but obviously your mileage will vary by context. And to be honest, I look at differential privacy through the lens of error propagation. I'm not a computer scientist by academic background, I'm actually a physicist. And I'll pause for a moment so that you can appreciate the particular wit of uh, Randall Monroe's XKCD cartoon here. We've already mentioned that an aggregation and averaging, averaging approach smooths the data out and removes a lot of the spiky detail. 
data which comes out the far end of a differential privacy transform still has its spike in us, but all the spikes are actually wrong. If you think of the I in CIA from earlier, differential privacy actually uh, very, very carefully munges and breaks the, 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 uh, the integrity, um, but while still retaining utility. There's actually a very old weakness in differential privacy too, or at least the algorithms that I've uh, seen from a, from a couple of years back. Um, and that just like individual characters in an Enigma machine, unless you were using the plug board, a string can never be transformed to itself in a differential privacy transform. Um, historically, the later Enigma-derived violet machines built and used in Warsaw Pact countries during the Cold War fixed that particular shortcoming. But if your model may be vulnerable to an inversion attack and has to be trained with sensitive data, this approach can actually afford you some seriously useful protection. We've got our prepared data now. Um, now we need to train a model with it and test it and run it. And when you think about poisoning data sets or trying to make models resilient against malice, there is rather a threshold of effect. Also, trying to make a single model robust against malice comes with introducing further complications around reducing its accuracy. As we probably know, um, well, um, fuzzing is uh, a technique that uh, gets used a lot in penetration testing. And um, it's also used a lot in code robustness testing. And you essentially, the core of fuzzing is taking the set of legitimate inputs for a program uh, bending them just out of spec and seeing if anything misbehaves in interesting ways. And OWASP, among others, have some good, have some good uh, written material on it. Uh, generative adversarial networks can be thought of as fuzzers for non-textual content. So be sure to uh, look at what kind of uh, testing, what kind of brute force testing in this context is most appropriate to your own models and test them before threat actors test them for you. Sometimes data actually just happens to crop up in the world at large, which makes models do a double take and produce weird results for reasons of their own. This tends to happen particularly in the visual domain if you're doing image analysis. And there's a good pair of libraries of test data here and, and an accompanying paper whose purpose is actually to provoke these effects. So test your models with data that may confound them yourself. But I mentioned that training your main model with badness could have effects on its accuracy. So now we have the idea of machine learning application firewalling. This is also the first of several applications we'll mention involving ensembles, which is an approach where you have several ML models, each of which does just one small thing very well, working in concert and linked together using regular human written code. So, so having uh, a model which uh, just does one small thing well, we're, we're back to classic Unix philosophy. There's another requirement to meet in operation which for, raises further questions. It's not actually officially recorded as the right to, to explanation, but it's a convenient shorthand name lots of people use for it. So back to reading the details. GDPR Chapter 3, Section 2, Article 13, Clause 3, F. Now, this is actually 3G in the UK version for now. Um, when people talk about GDPR, you need to be a bit careful in that there's actually at least 28 different versions of GDPR as interpreted into local law in each EU member state and elsewhere, not all of which are available in English. And the existence of automated decision making, including profiling, referred to in article, etc., and at least in those cases, meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and envisaged consequences of such processing to the data subject. But what qualifies as meaningful? Really interesting question. We've got SageMaker Clarify that can shed some light on this. Um, clarify, uh, yeah, so trained models will consider some model inputs more strongly than others normally when generating predictions. This is what you want and expect. For example, a loan application working, a loan application model for a bank uh, is likely to weigh credit history more heavily than other factors. So Clarify is integrated with SageMaker experiments 
so that after your model's been trained, SageMaker can provide a graph detailing the importance of each input for the model's overall decision-making process. It gives it a weighting. And these decisions may help you meet compliance requirements or determine if a particular model input has more influence than it ought to on a, on a given model's behavior. So Clarify actually uses SHAP under the lid. Uh, SHAP gives you an analysis of how strongly each input in a given, each input in a given out input set influences an output. But again, talk to your lawyers because it's a question for them as to whether SHAP output is considered an adequate form of explanation in a court of law should things come to that. SHAP also doesn't work everywhere. Um, in very much the same vein as um, you can get model blow-ups uh, with, um, uh, with infinite state sets in formal reasoning approaches, um, you can wind up um, having SHAP consume huge quantities of compute resource without careful application of scope limits when um, actually instrumenting your model. So be aware, um, the, the, uh, the book online here about interpretable, interpretable ML will give you a good grounding in where to actually put the limits on your instrumentation. And in SageMaker Model Monitor, you can, you can configure a monitoring job to check for changes to feature importance over time which gets visualized via graphs like the ones here. And this can be really useful when looking for model poisoning scenarios where someone has uh, gone injecting undesirable data into your data set. Once you've got a reliable model, you need to protect it. Because a working model is actually a valuable thing. Certainly, it'll involve a bunch of sunk cost. So how do you stop someone walking off with a copy of your model once you've built and trained one that's actually got good accuracy? And model inversion as a technique for um, extracting a copy of a model um, feels a lot like cryptanalysis of a weak cipher using differential known plaintext attacks, in my mind anyway. So if your attacker um, sends, your ta sends your, the target model a lot of data with small variations, they can measure whether the output changes a little or a lot for each input delta. So if all your reverse engineering is a simple classifier or regression, increased confidence means that you're further from the classifier dist distinguishing line that you're trying to figure out. So can you slow that data rate down in terms of trying to figure out um, where the uh, distinguishing line is? In some models, maybe, but probably not in something like the recommendation engine on the Amazon.com homepage. So a model just gets called with the SageMaker Invoke Endpoint API. So you could actually put an API gateway and Lambda function in front of this to rate shape the calls and only give the Lambda function the relevant IAM role with permissions to call the actual API endpoint. So here's our model with an API gateway and Lambda function on the input at the top right to rate limit input calls and also to add noise to the confidences on the output which will serve to confound this kind of uh, small delta, how, how closely am I approaching the line approach. Obviously, stopping your model being swapped in the event of credential mishandling is relatively straightforward with the service control policy in organizations. But while you can verify that your model's up and running with the usual monitoring services, how do you go about monitoring for accuracy? And hello, at this point, drift detection with SageMaker Model Monitor. If your model is doing continuous learning in particular and is therefore potentially poisonable, you can detect poisoning this way too. At which point, I mentioned that you should be taking frequent snapshots, restore a snapshot from just, from just before the model started misbehaving, and optionally replay your own copy of the logged input up until just before it starts doing so. And then that brings you back to a known good state. Now, if you spent your youth doing as much experimental physics as I did, you'll know how important error propagation is to determine overall output accuracy when using measurements from tools which have imperfect accuracy, as we've already mentioned. So confidence is returned by models, particularly um, classifiers and regression tools, aren't quite the same as errors in, um, in, in classic uh, measurements from, from a physics perspective, 
but you can turn them into errors using the transforms in the University of British Columbia paper that's linked to here, at which point you can then propagate them through your regular code that you're using to coordinate your ensemble and get a, an overall wrap-up error at the end. There's plenty of libraries already available for doing error propagation, which fit whatever language you're using. I've just picked an example Python one here. But there's also a nice crib sheet from Harvard just up the road um, covering how the maths works if you want to look at it from first principles for different algebraic operations and error propagation through them. And of course, once again, Randall Monroe's take on error propagation in XKCD is a simply, well, I look at it as a simplified and funnier version of the Harvard paper. As mentioned earlier, uh, you do need to assume that your models are going to return incorrect answers sometimes and make your overall program and classic code around your models as robust against this eventuality as you can. And this is probably my favorite XKCD cartoon to date. And yeah, it, it's just so funny because for so many models, because for many models, it's just so true. So there are two fundamental scenarios to deal with. And um, the easier one is uh, low confidence answers. Um, but you need to be careful and conservative with how you, with how you actually set your thresholding and also whether um, you have the opportunity to do data resampling to uh, potentially get a, a better um, confidence on the input. High confidence in a wrong answer is actually a much harder problem to identify before you can deal with it. So one approach here is model stacking, uh, which puts multiple models, ideally ones which use different machine learning frameworks in an ensemble. Um, if one returns results different to the others, then there's something funny going on. Uh, the paper at the bottom, though, um, actually states that a successful attack against one model is frequently a successful attack against many models, but your mileage may vary. Try it in the context of your own models and see how well it works for you. So let's say we've got a stack containing three models. If we just put an API gateway and Lambda combination to front the model invocation, just send the same query to all the models by invoking them um, from the Lambda function, we can collate and compare the results against a threshold of difference and raise an alert over SNS or similar and return an error if there's a particular disparity between the results the models return. And if you're doing continuous learning, the results your models return will change because the models aren't static. You, you, need, you therefore need to take a different approach in this case, effectively firewalling your model. So if you have a static model up front as an input filter, which is trained just with what badness would look like as a potential set of inputs to your model, um, you can then if, um, pass the input back to your Lambda function if the, input, if the input passes as OK, you can send it to your main model uh, that's actually uh, doing your, the analysis you want to do, or raise an alarm for error handling if not. So if we send our checked input to our actual model to get an answer, uh, we get our response back. We can then send the output from our model through SageMaker Drift Detector or another model functioning as an output badness filter to ensure that the outputs of an expected nature, and obviously again, um, alarm in our Lambda function if not, and recover your model by restoring a snapshot of it from a point in time before misbehavior was observed. Obviously then you only send the response back to the client if everything checks out. So let's see how all this fits together. Some model types are deterministic, others less so. Obviously, be careful how you scope the job each model performs, and we're going to get into this in a bit more detail. So neural networks in particular have considerations of their own. Um, their behavior can even be changed when you're training them by the order in which you send them the training data. Though unless they're continuous learning, once a neural network is trained, its behavior is reproducible at least. Um, some people we've found actually ask too much of one individual model. And there's actually a really nice example that a friend of mine found written up in Quanta magazine from a few years ago. If you search, um, if you search um, 
back archives of Quanta magazine for an article called Machine Learning Confronts the Elephant in the Room, you'll find it. And in that article, the researchers involved had actually um, trained a single model with identifying objects in a photo and naming them. Um, the model they trained was trained on images of objects you'd expect to find in a typical living room. The researchers then did a bit of editing to create a test image, which literally introduced a photo of an elephant, introduced an elephant into a photo that was standing behind the sofa. And the, as you might not be surprised to, to, to hear, when the unexpected elephant was introduced, the result was that uh, the naming capability got confused because it didn't know what an elephant was, but there was a surprising side effect. And that's that not only did the naming capability get confused, but so did the capability which identified one object as distinct from another. And you really wouldn't expect that. So instead of having one neural network based model performing multiple functions, instead, you're better off building an ensemble of neural networks operating in series hooked together with conventional code. So have one model identify discrete objects, put a bounding box around them, and then have a separate model try to identify the object within the bounding box. And obviously conven the conventional code gets the details of the objects from the first model and feeds them to the second as a list one at a time. And um, a paper published in, in April on Archive has provoked some head scratching in the industry as well. It's worth a read. Uh, the mechanisms we've mentioned for protecting your training data minimize the attack surface for this kind of approach uh, for a model you train yourself anyway, but also ensembles have a benefit here. Um, in that um, if uh, if you've got a uh, one model, one purpose approach, these also act to minimize the size of the attack surface for this kind of attack, where models you might have sourced from elsewhere are involved. So because unless the model that you sourced from elsewhere is the first model in the ensemble, and the ensemble takes raw input from an external user, your threat actor doesn't get to directly choose the input to the model that they might have backdoored. So you can actually use the first model in an ensemble as a protective measure against this kind of an attack. And this isn't really far removed from what step functions do to uh, string lambda functions together. So if you shift your perspective to treat a model as being part of a set of composable things in the scope of a larger view, you can orchestrate your models using much the same tools as you do lambda functions. Now, there's still a lot of research going on in this area, but guidance is starting to coalesce and become consistent. And here's mine so far. So I'll always just run through this little checklist when talking to people who are looking at using machine learning about the uh, protective measures that uh, they should uh, strongly consider applying to the models as they both uh, prepare them, train them, and use them. And of course, final point there, talk to your lawyers as and where deemed appropriate. So there are things that you can do to take away from this. Um, a lot, but not all of the material I've talked about here is covered in the well-architected machine learning lens white paper that uh, some friends and colleagues of mine wrote. I definitely put that at top of your, top, as top of your reading list for matters involving machine learning security on AWS. If you want to set SageMaker environments up like the ones that we've touched on here for yourselves, there's a couple of good self-paced workshops that you can work through and build test environments from. And if you're using SageMaker Studio, there's, a, there's the pair of blog posts I mentioned earlier, which are also very much recommended reading. First is about integrating network firewall, and the second makes all of the API endpoints for SageMaker Studio use private link and enables you to set up signed URLs very much like S3 signed URLs for SageMaker Studio console access. There's some really neat stuff in that post. So that's me essentially done. Thank you very much. I uh, hope this has uh, given you uh, some food for thought. I'm happy to uh, step down off the podium and we can uh, 
do a little Q&A if that's something you think would be useful. There's also another little uh, research topic that um, I wasn't able to squeeze into the deck but can perhaps talk about a bit on um, potentially looking at interactions between machine learning and the potential applicability of formal reasoning to machine learning models. So thank you.